Thank you. So today, the second talk, and it's also the last talk of the day. Uh, the talk is by Bart, and he will talk about sparsification of CSVs. Thank you for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be back in Bergen. And what better way to be back in Bergen than an entire week spent talking about kernelization. So I'm really enjoying my time here. Uh, those who saw the picture that was up that was last Friday, I'm also enjoying my stay here in Norway. And in the next hour, I will give an overview of work that has been going on in the last year, together with Hubi Chen and Astrid Pietersse, about sparsification for constraint satisfaction problems. And given the fact that we are in Bergen, um, I decided it would be nice to build sort of a mountaineering metaphor into this talk. So this will be a roadmap of what we're going to do. We're going to look at results in sparsification. We're going to start basically on the bottom left, downwards flat and shallow. We'll look at some elementary ideas. And throughout the talk, we're going to basically climb our way up to the mountain and get a picture of more generality uh, of what's going on and understand things at a more abstract level. So along the way, um, we'll see some particular results and uh, end up at generic understandings of CSPs defined in terms of a constraint language. We'll pass by and wave at MELTSEF embeddings along the way, but we don't actually get to go there today because that would take too much time. So that's the plan. If at any point something is unclear, feel free to stop me. In the beginning, I will be a bit informal, but it will all become nice and formal towards the end. Uh, if you're not willing to wait for that, just stop me and say what exactly I mean. Feder. You don't name the peak of the mountain. It's not the last slide yet. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So what we do in the beginning is we get, uh, as a warm-up, a look at the one in D set problem and other types of sparsification for constraint satisfaction problems. So CSPs form a general class of decision problems. We have some variables. We have to find an assignment of values to them. Usually these are true-false, zero-one values, but they can also be larger domain CSPs. And there's a list of constraints, and we want to find an assignment that satisfies all of them. Now here's some classic examples of what a constraint can look like, examples that you know. You can have a three CNF set instance and there a constraint on three variables x, y, z says at least one of x, y, z should be set to true. There's the not all equal variant where we demand that these variables do not all take the same value, so at least one must be true, at least one must be false. There's one in three set where we want exactly one of those three variables to be true. And it can go on and on, right? These are three natural examples of what a constraint can look like in a Boolean constraint satisfaction problem. Now, the complexity of this problem depends on the type of constraints that you're allowed to write. And we'll see that the complexity of three CNF set will differ from the complexity of one in three set if we're looking at this sparsification regime, even though both are MP-complete in the classic viewpoint. So informally, what we're interested in in this talk, you can think of it as kernelization, but with the number of variables being the parameter. So we tried to see, can we reduce the number of constraints that we have to some guaranteed bound in the number of variables? So what we'll be looking at is finding ways to efficiently reduce an n variable instance of a particular type of CSP down to an equivalent one that has some guaranteed upper bound on the form of n to the d constraints and we try for uh, making d as small as possible. That's informally the goal in the next hour. So as a warm-up, let's look at this one in three set problem. And the main insight is that sometimes we can show that a constraint is redundant because it is implied by a bunch of other constraints that are already in your input. And in such cases, we can drop the redundant constraint without changing the answer. To see how it plays out in practice, let's look at a one in three set input that has four variables, A, B, C, D, and four constraints here on the left. So we demand that one, exactly one of A, B, C is set to true. Then if we interpret true as a one and false as a zero, then this is equivalent to demanding that a plus b plus c is equal to one, right? There's a one to one correspondence between a zero one assignment satisfying this constraint and this equality holding. Similarly, if we have a negation, then we can just write one minus the variable that's being indicated. And in this way, we can translate all of the constraints we have into linear equalities. 
And now observe that if we take the first equality, subtract the second, and add the third, then these 1 minus d's cancel, there's two of the c's that cancel, the b's cancel. So actually, this linear combination of the first three constraints gives us exactly the fourth. And this means that if the first three constraints are satisfied, then their equalities hold, which means that any linear combination of these equalities hold, which implies that the fourth constraint was also satisfied. So under these conditions, removing the fourth constraint not only preserves the satisfiability of the system, it preserves the entire solution space, the entire set of assignments which are satisfying. And this brings us to the following general principle. If we can write each constraint of our CSP as some equality, and we find that the equality of a particular constraint C is a linear combination of the equalities of other constraints in our system, then this constraint C is redundant because it being satisfied is implied if all the other ones are implied. So in this case, we could then remove such a constraint. So this is the main uh, workhorse behind the sparsification algorithms we're going to see. So using this idea, let's see how we get a systematic sparsification for this one in three set problem. And on input, suppose we get an instance of one in three set, it has n variables and m constraints in total. Now each of these constraints, we can write them as a linear equality, demanding the sum uh, of the literal values to be exactly one. And we can rewrite this set of m equalities that we get in this way in matrix form. So it will be convenient to have zero as our right hand sides, so we just subtract one from both sides, and then we can view each constraint as basically a weighted sum of either uh, constant values or variables, and the right-hand side is zero. So then one constraint is the inner product of a row of coefficients versus this column of variables and the value one to deal with the constant term in our polynomial, and then each such inner product should be zero. Right, so I can just read off which coefficients I have to put in this matrix for this set of linear equalities to capture exactly my constraint satisfaction problem. All right, every one of the m constraints, we turned it into a row. And the number of columns that we have in this matrix, well, we have one column for every variable, giving its coefficient, and we have one column for the coefficient of the constant term. So even though the number of rows might be large, the number of columns is upper bounded in terms of how many variables we have. So the rank of this matrix will be bounded by n plus one, which means that if you compute any basis, it have size at most order n. So what we now do is by Gaussian elimination, we find a basis of the rows of this matrix. We find n plus one rows such that any remaining row can be written as a linear combination of the rows we have. And as output of our sparsification procedure, we see the rows in my basis, which constraints were they generated from, those constraints I keep in my sparsified instance and all the other constraints I forget about. So we're taking a subset of our original constraints, which means that clearly if the original one was satisfiable, this subset is also satisfiable. And if an assignment satisfies the constraints in the basis, then all the equalities of the basis are satisfied. All the remaining equalities can be written as linear combinations of them, so they must also be satisfied. This preserves exactly the set of satisfying assignments to my system. So there was nothing in here where we used the fact that classes have size three, so actually this works for all one in D sat problems, where D is whatever you like. So put formally, there's a polynomial time algorithm that you feed it an instance of one in D sat on some set of variables V and some classes C, and it will output you a subset of the original constraints. There's at most n plus one of them. And any truth assignment satisfies the original set of constraints if and only if it satisfies the sparsified set. Good. Now let's briefly take a minute to appreciate the distinction between how many constraints do I have in my sparsified input and how many bits do I need to write down that input because there can be a gap between the two. For this one in D set problem, we just saw how to sparsify to n plus one constraints. And this is asymptotically optimal because if you could reduce to little o of n constraints, each of them having 
constant size, then by repeating this, you would actually solve the problem and get p equal to np. So the number of constraints in this sparsification is asymptotically optimal. Now, if you want to write down what your sparsified input looks like, then you have to specify, well, what does my constraint look like? If there are d variables in there, you need log n bits to write down the numbers of the variables appearing in your clause. So in d log n bits, you can write down what one clause of your uh, one in d set problem looks like. So if this d is a constant, then uh, we can absorb it in the big O notation and we get a compression down to order n log n bits for the system we have. However, if you talk about the exact set problem, I have clauses of potentially unbounded length and I want exactly one literal to be satisfied, then we can't really ignore the fact that to store one constraint, we might need order of n bits to indicate which variables occur in this constraint and which don't. So in that case, the compression size we get in this way is only n squared, even though the number of constraints we have was order n. This, it turns out, is unavoidable. So we proved that there is no generalized kernelization, no compression, if you will, for this exact set problem parameterized by the number of variables that has bit size order n to the 2 minus epsilon unless np is in cohen p poly. So in general, um, it's reasonable that this gap between number of constraints and a coding size exists if your clauses can be arbitrarily long. For the rest of this talk, though, we're going to focus on constraint satisfaction problems where the constraints have constant arity. Right? So we assume that this d is a constant, we'll absorb it in the big O notation so that whenever we get down to a certain number of constraints, we can encode it using only log n uh, factor more bits. So up to now on, uh, the encoding size and the number of constraints of CSPs we look at will be equivalent up to a log n factor. Exact set is I give you a clause and I demand that exactly one literal is satisfied and all the others are not satisfied. So one in D set is exact set with clauses of size three, but in the general exact set problem, your clauses can be arbitrarily long. Still, I want exactly one literal to be satisfied. Good. So for one in D set, we saw something very good happen. We sparsified to a linear number of constraints. If we look at the standard DCNF satisfiability problem, then we don't get such good behavior. There's an easy way to sparsify it to order n to the d constraints for the simple reason that if you have n variables and clauses of size d, well, over n variables, there's two n possible literals, so two n to the d possible clauses you could write down. If you simply keep one of them uh, and use a bit factor to indicate which of the clauses are present and which are not, then order of n to the d is the encoding size and the number of distinct clauses that you get, and you can't really improve on this. There's a very nice paper by Dallin van Melkebeek showing that if d uh, is some constant, at least three, then there's no generalized kernelization for d, c, and f set parameterized by the number of variables that has bit size better than this trivial remove duplicated clauses bound of n to the d, unless n, p is in column people. Okay, so now we've seen sort of two extremes. For one in three set, we got very good sparsification behavior down to a linear number of constraints. For three set, we got basically the worst case sparsification behavior. And it's interesting to note that the difference in sparsification complexity seems to be related to the freedom you have. How many ways are there to satisfy a clause? So to satisfy your one in three clause, you need the number of satisfied literals to be exactly one. To satisfy a normal three clause, you need the number of satisfied literals to be one, two, or three. So in truth, there's three ways to do that. Next up, we're going to look at the not all equal set problem, right? We have three variables and we want to not to all evaluate to the same value. So they can't be all zero, they can't be all one, so the number of satisfied literals, if we are to satisfy this constraint, is either one or two. So here we have a freedom of two, and we'll see that this freedom of two is again what determines the optimal sparsification size in this case. Let's see why. We're going to write a three nodal equal clause as an inequality, uh, not of a linear polynomial, but of a degree two polynomial. 
So I claim that if I have three zero one variables, a, b, and c, these are not all equal. These would satisfy a not all equal clause exactly when the following holds a, b plus a, c plus b, c minus a minus b minus c is equal to minus one. So you can think of this as we see how many pairs of variables are one, we subtract how many individual variables are one, and we need that to come out to minus one. And I claim that it, the clause is not all equal satisfied exactly when this comes out to minus one. Let's see why. If all my variables are zero, then it is not the case that this clause is satisfied, but then the left-hand side is zero, which is not equal to minus one, so indeed then this doesn't hold. If all my variables are equal to one, then there are three pairs that are set to one, and we subtract three individual variables, so we also get zero on the left-hand side. So this setting doesn't not all equal satisfy it, but also it doesn't satisfy this equality. If I have a single variable set to one, then I will get zero pairs contributing. I subtract a single variable from minus one, so then indeed this is an equality. And if two variables are set to one, then I have a single pair contributing a plus one. I have two individual variables giving me two minus one, so again, then this is satisfied. So I can think of any three not all equal clause as a degree two equality. So if I now have a set of m constraints of a three not all equal set input, I will write them in matrix form again. So what type of entries do I need in my matrix? Well, these equalities deal with monomials of degree at most two, so either individual variables or products of variables. So if I take uh, this column vector containing the individual variables and the products of pairs of variables and a constant, then I can write any equality of this form as the inner product of some row of coefficients with this column of monomials equal to zero. So I collect all of these constraints, I put them in my matrix, and this time around, well, uh, the number of columns I have is now order of n squared because we have one for every pair of variables, which means the rank of my matrix is order n squared. If I do Gaussian elimination to get a row basis as before, then by the exact same argumentation that we've just seen, the constraints that generated these rows in the basis those form a subset of the constraints that preserve the solution space exactly. Because anything that I forget about when removing the other constraints, I can write their constraints as linear combinations of things in the basis, which implies they are automatically satisfied. Good, so that was a down-to-earth ad hoc view of what um, equalities look like that capture three not all equal set. Let's go slightly more general and let's look at D not all equal set for arbitrary values of D. Now I claim that if I look at a D not all equal clause that has some literals L1 through LD, this is satisfied precisely when the number of satisfied literals belongs to the range of one up to minus D. It's not good if the number of satisfied literals is zero because then they're all false. It's not good if the number of satisfied literals is D, then they're all true, but anywhere in between is good. And this now is equivalent um, to the following scary looking polynomial being zero. So let's parse this. Uh, all the way in the middle, we have the value of a literal. This is either just the variable if it's a positive literal or it's one minus the variable if it's a negative literal. So this summation here is just the number of satisfied literals. We're summing over all literals and taking their value. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the product and this product goes from I up to D minus one this is basically the same range in which we want the number of satisfied literals to lie. And then every term of the product is the difference between the current value of i and the number of satisfied literals. So if the number of satisfied literals lies in this range, then there will be an i where i and the number of satisfied literals are the same. So then I have a zero term in my product, my polynomial will be zero. But if my number of satisfied literals falls outside of this range, then this difference will be non-zero everywhere, so I get a product of non-zero terms, which is non-zero. So regardless of what D is, this polynomial will always characterize when my D not all equal clause is satisfied. And observe that this is a linear expression, so we have a product of basically D minus one linear expression, so this is a D minus one degree polynomial as we want it. 
So any d not all equal class can be written as a degree d minus 1 equality, which means that if you put those equalities in a matrix, compute a basis, and keep only those constraints, then you can sparsify d not all equal set down to n to the d minus 1 constraints, and then you encode them with this log n overhead for each one of them. Good. Uh, we just did the first steps uh, towards our higher viewpoint of understanding for uh, sparsification of CSPs. And next up, we'll be looking more closely into which things can I capture by polynomials and which things can I not, and why. So let's look at the following example. It's uh, a constraint type that acts on three variables at the same time. And I present a constraint as the set of assignments that satisfy it. Right? So this is a constraint that would be satisfied if the first variable is true but the others are false. If the first is false, second is true, the third is false, and so on. Right? This is a constraint type on four satisfying assignments. Now, we've seen that if we can represent this as a degree one polynomial, we could sparsify to order n constraints. So we ask ourselves, can we capture this type of constraint by a linear polynomial? So what we would want is to find some polynomial uh, which is linear, so it's to form some constant plus a weighted sum of variables, such that this polynomial is zero precisely when this assignment satisfies my constraint, when this is a tuple that belongs to my set of satisfying constraints. Let's see if this can be done. Suppose we had a linear polynomial that indeed evaluates to zero on all of these satisfying assignments. Right? So then I evaluate my polynomial at this satisfying assignment 1, 0, 0, and then the value is this constant term plus a1 because I'm multiplying a2 and a3 by 0. And similarly, these are the evaluations of my polynomial at the other uh, satisfying assignments, and by assumption, I'm getting all zeros on these. But if I get all zeros on these assignments, then if I take this linear combination, then clearly a linear combination of zeros is 0. So then this linear combination has value 0, but if you see what happens, then this alpha 1 cancels with this alpha 1, this cancels here, and this cancels here. So that actually, then also the value of alpha 0 must be 0, but alpha 0 is the evaluation of my supposed polynomial at the point 0, 0, 0. So if I have something that evaluates to 0 on these satisfying assignments, then it also evaluates to 0 on this uh, all zeros assignment, which was not satisfying. So it's impossible to find a linear polynomial over the reals um, that captures this constraint in this way. However, there's a catch. Uh, if you work over a different field than the reals, then, well, maybe there is no value a half in the field that you're using, and then this issue goes away. So note that the satisfying assignments here, they're exactly the ones that set an odd number of variables to true. Either one or three of the variables are set to true. So that you can capture the constraint that we have here by the degree one polynomial over g of two that says if I sum my variables and I add one, then I get exactly zero mod two. So this illustrates that sometimes to get a linear polynomial that captures your constraint, you need to work over a different field than the reals or the rationals. Finite fields might help you. Okay, um, there are cases where even a finite field won't help you, and let's see what happens. So I'm going to look at a slightly different version uh, of this constraint. Here it goes. Uh, so now my satisfying assignments set two or three values to one. And suppose there was a linear polynomial that represents this constraint. Well, we can do something similar as before, right? We write down what would the evaluation of this polynomial look like. If it evaluates to zero on all of these points, now we take a different linear combination. It's one that has integer coefficients. And that's important because linear combinations of integer coefficients I can write in any ring. Uh, regardless of whether I have values a half there or uh, things like that. And, well, if all of these evaluates to zero, then my linear combination evaluates to zero. 
But if you see what happens, well, I had three times alpha zero, I subtract two times that, and all of these here I have two individual alpha ones, but I subtract twice alpha one. Again, this comes out to the evaluation of my polynomial on the point zero, 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 which was not a satisfying assignment. So if this is the set of satisfying assignments of your constraints, then no degree one polynomial will capture it regardless of what ring you're going to work over. Sometimes you need degree larger than one to capture what your constraint is doing. So the general obstruction principle that we'll also see later in this talk, if you have um, a constraint type and there's some unsatisfying tuple that you can write as a linear combination of the satisfying tuples, because that's what's happening here. If you look at the level of these satisfying assignments, then adding uh, these three satisfying assignments, subtracting twice this satisfying assignment lands you exactly in this unsatisfying assignment, which was why this worked. If you have such a linear combination with integer coefficients that sum to exactly one, then there is no linear polynomial over any ring um, that evaluates to zero on all your satisfying assignments, but to a non-zero on your unsatisfying assignment. And the fact that these um, coefficients sum to one, which happened here and also in the previous example, is important to make sure that the constant term uh, ends up at the right value if you take this linear combination. Good. Ah, so I'm saying that if you have this linear combination of satisfying assignments and it, this linear combination gives you an unsatisfying assignment, if the coefficients are integers that sum to one, then there is no linear polynomial over any ring that is zero on your satisfying assignments but non-zero on this unsatisfying assignment. <coughs> So we've made it past uh, the land of polynomials, and now we're basically starting our climb towards generality, towards a more complete picture of what's going on generally. And at this point, um, it's time to introduce some terminology, in particular about constrained languages. So a constrained language denoted by gamma, it's a finite set of relations, and for the purpose of this talk, they will be relations over uh, domain 01, Boolean relations. So here is the relation um, that has three satisfying assignments and a clause with three positive literals is one in three satisfied precisely when this tuple belongs to this relation. Now if I have the one in three set problem, usually I can also write negations. I can have negative literals. And to accommodate for that, we have some extra relations in our constraint language. If I have a clause that has two negations, then I look at this relation R2, which I basically got by inverting the values in the first two columns of R0. And then a clause with two negative literals and a positive one is one in three satisfied exactly when the assignment to X, Y, and Z belongs to the set of satisfying assignments of R2. And similarly, if I have one or three negations, I can pick um, one of these four <coughs> relations such that my clause is satisfied precisely when the values of these variables belong to that relation. So that the one in three set problem is exactly the same as a constraint satisfaction problem if as constraints I'm allowed to say the values of these variables, just variables now, no more negations or making literals, the values of these variables should belong to one of these four specified relations. All good? So, second. If you make one relation which is the union, um, then it would give you one constraint that is more satisfying assignments. So you want to be able to... Um, so if you take the union, then some assignment would satisfy the union either if x, y, z has exactly one, but also if not x, not y, not z is exactly one, and that's not what we want. So sometimes it's useful to have multiple different relations in your constraint language. So if we have a relation, then the arity will just be how many positions is it defined on? How many variables does it take to apply such a constraint? Now, formally, the constraint satisfaction problem for this particular constraint language, telling you what type of constraint you're allowed to write, is the following. As input, we get a set of variables 
there's n of them, and we get a set of constraints, where a constraint says, I want to apply this relation to these variables. So you have to say which variables to apply them to, so you have to give me the indices of the variables, and the number of indices you give me is exactly the arity of the relation you want to apply. And the question is, can I find an assignment uh, to my variables? In our setting, this will be a uh, Boolean domain, so a zero, one assignment such that whenever I have a constraint on the list that says apply this relation to the variables with these indices, then it holds that the evaluation of the corresponding variables gives you a tuple that is in the set of satisfying assignments of this constraint. It's in the relation. All right. So now that we have this understanding of how a constrained language tells you what type of constraints you get to write, we can try to characterize how difficult your constraint satisfaction problem is based on what the constraint language was. Which constraints do I get to write? And a early result, very beautiful, that got all of this going is Schaefer's zygotomy theorem, which says that if you have a finite set of Boolean relations that form your constraint language, then two things happen. Either the corresponding constraint satisfaction problem is polynomial time solvable, or it's NP complete. And there's a very nice characterization of which of the two occurs. And this characterization is in terms of closure properties of these sets um, of satisfying assignments in the language of universal algebra. So I won't go into these definitions in detail, but we'll see a flavor of this coming up later on in the talk. So aren't there equivalent characterization also without universal algebra, like in terms of polymorphisms? Yes, you Yes. Robert. Just about your quotation. Uh, so, I mean, the, the, the number of, the, maybe there's just some, uh, so the number of clauses you have is, there's eight different kinds of clauses, right? Depending on what's negated and what isn't, two to the third. So, how come you don't need eight relations in your, uh, in your language? Okay, so the question was, there's eight type of clauses depending on what's negated. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but for one in three set, the order doesn't matter. Right, so I can reshuffle and then it only matters how many negations did I have and I put the ones with negations first if I order my variables. I see. So you know, in your CSP representation you're assuming you're representing a SAT instance where you reshuffle and then you get this. Yes, I'm saying if I have a SAT instance I can write it as a CSP instance over this constraint language by reshuffling as needed. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so Schaefer's dichotomy theorem already said there are some cases in which you can say what happens to the CSP's complexity depending on what's in gamma. And what we're interested in now is, in terms of sparsification, given a constrained language gamma, what is the best bound on the sparsification size, number of constraints I can reduce to, uh, in polynomial time? So this is, uh, in terms of constrained language, what we're after. So let me sketch you a brief timeline of what happened in this area. And this nice paper of Dallin van Melkebeek that I mentioned, it was first appearing in 2010, which said that for the normal KCNF set problem, you can't reduce to something smaller than n to the k clauses, essentially. So this started off with bad news. Then in 2015, I had a paper with Astrid where we showed that the not all equal set problem behaves differently. You can shave one off the exponent. And back then, this was sort of an ad hoc application of an old lemma of Lovas that we dug up. And it was one year later that we really understood what was going on. Then we saw this interpretation as capturing constraints by low degree polynomials. We saw that exact set can be sparsified to a linear number. And in general, if you have constraints of the form, um, the assignment to these variables forms a root of a degree polynomial, exactly what Ost had mentioned in her talk yesterday, then this can be sparsified to order n to the d constraints. A year later, there was a very nice paper of uh, Victor Lagerquist and Magnus Wallström, which viewed this from the viewpoint of universal algebra. And they interpreted what we were doing as basically taking your CSP and embedding it into a tractable CSP over a larger domain, for which the fact that it's tractable allows you to find redundant constraints for the relaxation, which are then also redundant for your original. Uh, so unfortunately, I don't have time to go into what they did, but it influenced us a great deal. It's a very nice paper. Last year at IPEC, together with Hubi Chen, we developed various characterizations of what is the best sparsification you can have. 
depending on what your constraint type looked like, that I will summarize in the next half an hour, and that brings us to worker right here. Good. So now let me give you the formal definition of what this polynomial-based framework for sparsification looked like in its full generality. We look at a relation given as the set of satisfying assignments, and we say this is captured by degree d polynomials. If you can find a sequence of degree d polynomials, doesn't matter how many there are, uh, for each polynomial you get to pick which modulus you use. So one polynomial can be over the integers mod 3, the others over the integer mod 12, and so on. And what you want is some assignment of 0, 1 values is a satisfying assignment of your relation, precisely when all of the polynomials evaluate to 0 on this assignment with the corresponding modulus that you got to pick. So to make this concrete, you can think about it as a Boolean assignment satisfies your relation precisely when it's a root of all polynomials that you wrote down with the respective modulus. So here is a relation that is defined on seven variables with seven satisfying assignments. And fortunately, it has a nicer representation than this. Uh, it comes from the Fano plane. So the Fano plane has seven points and seven lines, where we also interpret this circle here as being a line through the points u, w, and v. And now I say that an assignment um, where every point is a variable, an assignment is satisfying if it sets exactly the variables of one line to true and everything else to false. So here we have the satisfying assignment that sets a, b, and u to true. That's exactly this line. At the bottom we have the satisfying assignment that sets exactly u, v, and w to true. That's exactly this line. Right? So the final plane tells us what the satisfying assignments of this relation are. And now let's see how we can capture this relation by degree one polynomials. Okay, so we're going to write down a list of polynomials such that something is a satisfying assignment of this relation, something sets exactly one line to true and everything else to false, precisely when all of my polynomials evaluate to zero. So I claim that some assignment satisfies this final relation, when first of all the following holds. If I look at the values of a, b, and u, this first line, then their sum is 1 mod 2. If I look at the next line, a, m, w, their sum is 1 mod 2. If I look at the last line, u, v, w, their sum is 1 mod 2. Right? So I'm demanding that for each of the seven lines of the Fano plane, the sum of the variables there is 1 mod 2. And any satisfying assignment indeed satisfies these constraints, um, because if this is a constraint of the line that I'm picking, then there's three points I'm setting to true, which is 1 mod 2. If this is the constraint from a line that I'm not picking, then any two lines meet in exactly one point, so we also get an odd number there. I need one more polynomial equality to capture what's going on. I also need to demand that the sum of all my variables is 3. And if we just say we work modulo a sufficiently large number, then maybe modulo 11, this sum is 3. Okay, so again, any satisfying assignment clearly satisfies this last constraint. So we've just argued that all the satisfying assignments of my relation satisfy all of these. If we have something that doesn't um, satisfy all of these, that's not a satisfying assignment, well, if it sets a different number of things to true than three, then clearly it already violates this last condition. If it sets three things to true, but that they're not aligned, you pick two that are true, any two points lie on a common line, then the third guy was not on this line, so this gives you a sum that gives you to 2 instead of 1 mod 2. So together, this system of polynomial equations captures this relation, and if you subtract the appropriate numbers from the right-hand side, you can write them as the demands that something is a root. Now, I can point out that we need two different moduli here to capture this relation, and you can show that just using equalities mod 2, you cannot capture this relation. Sometimes it helps to have more moduli. Good. So now we understand what it means to capture a relation, and the sparsification framework can now be summarized as follows. If each relation in your constraint language can be captured by degree d polynomials, then you can efficiently uh, reduce an instance of the CSP to one on a subset of the original constraints that has exactly the same satisfying assignments and whose number of constraints is order n to the d. And this basically follows from Gaussian elimination, 
if your modulus is not a prime number, you need to do something slightly different, but in spirit, it's still Gaussian illumination. And this big O now hides factors that depends on gamma. In particular, it hides a multiplicative constant depending on how many moduli you picked. Okay, but this is fixed once your constraint language is fixed. So the upshot is that if each relation in your constraint language can be captured by degree d polynomials, you can sparsify to order n to the d constraints. So this is a pretty powerful tool, and it raises a bunch of questions. For example, which relations can I capture using a polynomial whose degree is strictly smaller than the arity? Because then you can reduce to a number of constraints that less than simply the bound you get from how many distinct clauses can I write down. So we say that cases where this happens have a non-trivial sparsification. You can also ask, what is the best case behavior? Which relations can I capture by degree one polynomials? And how do you find such polynomials? I can tell you in the past we found them by hand, but that's pretty tedious. And we've now developed a more general understanding of how you can algorithmically find polynomials that capture your constraints. So let's first look at this first question. For which type of relations can we get a non-trivial sparsification bound? So let's look at some constraint language for which the CSP is NP-hard, and let K be the maximum arity of any relation in there. I can write order n to the k distinct constraints for such a constraint language, and when can we sparsify to strictly fewer than that? So the claim is that if each of the maximum arity relations in your constraint language has number of assignments minus the ones that are satisfying different than one, the number of falsifying assignments is anything except one, then you can efficiently sparsify the CSP to order n to the k minus one constraints. Essentially, only the CNF set clause, a normal CNF clause, has only one falsifying assignment. That's the only hard case. And it's pretty surprising if you ask me. So the way this goes, and we'll see it in a minute, is that under this condition, you can find a polynomial that has degree only k minus 1 that captures your constraint. And there's a counterpart which says that if there is a maximum arity relation that has only one falsifying assignment, then actually you get a lower bound. Um, then by a reduction from SAT, you can prove that you can sparsify to n to the k minus epsilon constraints. So this condition exactly captures which Boolean relations have a non-trivial sparsification and which ones do not. So let me give you the basic ideas and the proof of how this capturing polynomial of degree k minus 1 comes about. So the statement says, I have my Boolean relation. The number of falsifying assignments, I assume it here to be larger than 1. Earlier it said unequal to 1, but if there's zero falsifying assignments, clearly this relation is irrelevant. I just forget about it. There's more than one falsifying assignment. I now pick one particular falsifying assignment I'm looking at. I'm going to find a polynomial that evaluates to non-zero on this particular falsifying assignment and on to zero on all the satisfying ones. And then my collection of polynomials that together captures this constraint will be built basically taking one for every unsatisfying assignment that they have to block. So I construct this polynomial by induction on k. If k is 1, then my relation must be empty because there were more than one falsifying assignments. And if I have only one position, there's two assignments in total. All of them are falsifying. So then picking the polynomial of degree 0, which is always 1, suffices because it will be non-zero on u. And 2 is vacuously true because there are no satisfying assignments in this case. So for the induction step, if the arity is larger than 1, I'm going to um, use this assumption that there's more than one falsifying assignment. So there's a second falsifying assignment I call W. And there's two cases. If my two falsifying assignments agree on some position, then for ease of presentation, I'm going to assume they agree on the last position, and they both have a 1 there. This is not a big loss of generality. Now I'm going to define a new relation of arity k minus 1. What I do is I take all the satisfying assignments that end in the same way as u and w do, that end at a 1. I'm taking all those satisfying assignments and I chop off the 1 to get uh, an assignment of k minus 1 positions. And all those projections I put in a new relation r minus 1 of arity k minus 1. Now, the number of falsifying assignments for this new relation is larger than 1 because both u and w ended at a 1. So these will both be different falsifying assignments of my new relation r prime. So now I can apply induction to get a polynomial 
that is zero on everything of my projected relation, but it's non-zero on u prime, uh, because this was a falsifying assignment of r prime. And now my overall polynomial, this will be degree k minus 2 by induction. I build my polynomial by taking the variable of the last position xk and multiplying it by the polynomial I get from induction. Let's see why this is good. If xk is 0, then this polynomial will be 0. So for all assignments that have the last position 0, I will satisfy the second condition. And since u ends at a 1, I'm also good on condition 1. If I have an assignment that ends at a 1, um, then if this was a satisfying assignment, I know that I put it in R prime, so this polynomial will evaluate to 0 on it. The product will be 0. And if I have exactly the assignment u, then its projection was a falsifying assignment of R prime, for which the smaller polynomial gave me a non-zero. X is 1, so a non-zero, so then this is a non-zero outcome. Okay, so that was the case when our two satisfying assignments um, agreed on some position. If they disagree on every position, then again, with no lo big loss of generality, assume that u is all zeros and w is all ones. Then basically, this is not all equal set. We're going to use the same polynomial as for not all equal set because the um, this falsifying assignments we want to rule out are all zeros and all ones. And as long as our polynomial is non-zero on these and zero on everything else, we're good in terms of the condition of the statement. So now we use the polynomial for not all equal set, and it works for exactly the same reasons as before. How can you assume that u zero and w one without using it? It's no big loss of general. Like instead of um, putting a variable, you put one minus the variable in the polynomial you construct. So you have to do a bit more of notation, but nothing really changes. Good. So this proves that for every unsatisfying assignment, I can find a polynomial that weeds it out, basically. So then I can capture the entire relation by weeding out the unsatisfying assignments one at a time. And then I get this claimed result that if the number of non-satisfying assignments is not 1, I can efficiently sparsify to n to the k minus 1 constraints. Good. So here's the first open problem. We just saw which Boolean constraint languages have a non-trivial sparsification, but over a larger domain, we know very little. So concrete open problem, find me a characterization of the constraint languages on a domain of size 3 for which you get a non-trivial sparsification, like a reduction to n to the k minus 1 bits, for example. Good. We just made it past the non-trivial sparsification regime of our climb to the summit. And next up, we're going to uh, look when can you capture a relation by a degree 1 polynomial. When do we get the best case sparsification behavior? <coughs> So this is where I inline uh, polymorphisms, essentially, for those who know the term. I say that a relation is preserved by all alternating operations if whenever I take an odd length sequence of satisfying assignments to my relation, the following implication holds. If I get a new assignment by taking the alternating sum of the satisfying assignments, and I do this component-wise, just like vectors, if this thing happens to be a 0, 1 vector, then I need this to be a satisfying assignment. So essentially I'm saying if an alternating sum of satisfying assignments ends up being a 0, 1 assignment, then it should be a satisfying one instead of an unsatisfying one. Okay, so an example, here are the satisfying assignments of the binary OR relation, and this is not preserved by all alternating operations, because if I take the satisfying 1, 0 assignment, I subtract the satisfying 1, 1 assignment, I add the satisfying 0, 1 assignment, then I get 0, 0, which is a 0, 1 assignment, but it's not a satisfying one. So this violates the condition that I have. On the other hand, if I have the 1 in 3 sat relation, then this is preserved. Um, it's hard to show that, but for example, if you take these three satisfying assignments, then their sum comes out to something that's not a 0, 1 assignment, so the implication is fine. Now what we prove is the following characterization. A Boolean relation can be captured by degree 1 polynomials in the formal way we've just seen if and only if your relation is preserved by all alternating operations. So this gives you a characterization of when you can find a linear polynomial to capture your constraint depending on basically closure properties of the set of satisfying assignments. So some terminology, we say a relation is preserved by all alternating operations, then we call it balanced. 
And if your entire constraint language is built up out of such balanced relations, then we call the entire constraint language balanced. So the upshot is, if your constraint language is balanced, then you can sparsify to a linear number of constraints. But there's also a side effect. If your constraint language is not balanced, then there is this alternating sum that shows it's not. This gives you sort of a witness structure for the fact it is not balanced. And in some cases, we can turn these witness structures into sparsification lower bounds. And this allows us to prove characterizations of what the optimal sparsification size is. Good. So armed with this understanding of balanced relations, we now move on to see what happens for symmetric CSPs. A Boolean relation is called symmetric if whether or not an assignment is satisfying depends only on the number of ones in the assignment and not on where they are. Right? So any satisfying assignment, if you permute it, will still be a satisfying assignment. One in three sat is a symmetric CSP. Okay, so now we say that a constraint language is symmetric if each of the relations in there is symmetric. If you have a finite constraint language for which the CSP is NP-complete, we get the following characterization. You can get a sparsification to a linear number of constraints in polynomial time if and only if your constraint language is balanced. So one side we already seen, if your constraint language is balanced, then in general you get a compression to a linear number of constraints. But this is an example where we can turn this witness into a kernelization lower bound. If your constraint language is not balanced, then we can prove, under the assumption NP non and co and P poly, that you can't get a compression to N to the 2 minus epsilon bits. So either we get a linear compression or we get a quadratic lower bound. So for symmetric Boolean um, constraints, we know exactly when you get the best case linear behavior. Now it turns out that um, there's a very elegant um, alternative characterization of what it means for a symmetric relation to be balanced. You can just figure it out uh, by something like an arithmetic progression on which weights satisfy the constraint and which weights do not. But I don't want to stare at this too long, just men to mention that it exists. So there's also an open problem associated to this. I just showed you that for Boolean symmetric constraint language, we know exactly when you get linear sparsification and when you don't. But beyond linear sparsification, we know very little. So it would be very nice um, to have a characterization of what the optimal sparsification size is, depending on what gamma is. So maybe the optimal size is n to the 5, maybe it's n to the 11. How do you tell what the optimal size is by inspecting what the satisfying weights are of the relations you have in your constraint language? It would be nice to know. Good. So we're getting close to the top. We've just had symmetric CSPs. There is one more uh, result waiting for us at the very top, and it deals with exactly this question, to characterize what is the optimal sparsification size. And in some cases, we can do it. So the characterization I will show you is based on what is the largest OR relation that I can get out of something in my constraint language in a certain technical sense. And this technical sense, we called it cone definition for the fact that you get to use constants, co, and negations, the ni, and you get to repeat variables, but you don't get to introduce new variables. So instead of doing this formula, let me give you an example. On the left, we have the satisfying assignments to the not all equal relation. On the right, we have the satisfying assignments to binary or. And now from this relation, I can uh, cone define the binary or relation as follows. If I have an assignment and I want to know if it satisfies binary or, then I take the same assignment, I plug in the constant zero at the end, and then I test if it satisfies this not all equal relation. And in general, I can cone define an OR from a host relation if I can find a way to plug in variables, plug in negations and constants such that one satisfies OR if the plugged in version satisfies the relation I have. Good. So using this um, notion, I can formally characterize what the best sparsification is, at least for all constrained languages that deal with relations of size at most three. So look at some constrained language where every relation has arity at most three, and let k denote the arity of the largest or that you can define using the notion we just seen. Then you can sparsify the corresponding CSP to n to the k constraints, 
but you can't sparsify it to order n to the k minus epsilon constraints for any positive epsilon unless np is in column p poly. So this pins down exactly what the best sparsification size is, can come out as n or n squared or n cubed, and it tells you what happens based on what the largest or is that you can express. Now, it would be very nice to have such an understanding in general, but we already know, thanks to the work of Victor and Magnus, that this is not the characterization it holds in general. There are arities for which you can't even define uh, an or of size 2, for which, say, you don't even have a kernel of size n to the 100. So beyond 3, there is a point where this type of characterization no longer holds. It might be that it still holds for, say, arity 4 or 5, but we haven't managed to prove that so far. But the nice thing is it characterizes what the optimal sparsification size is, and it does so based on a condition that's pretty easy to verify. And it tells you that, well, the engine underlying all of these positive results is the polynomial framework. So it tells you that this polynomial framework for sparsification is what gives you the optimal results in this regime of constrained languages. So an open problem related to this, what we would like, of course, is to characterize for any constrained language gamma, what is the best sparsification you can get. And a first step would be to figure out for which ones can you get a linear and for which ones can you not. And the first obstacle uh, that we're currently stuck at is the following relation. It has five uh, satisfying assignments uh, and a bunch of columns. And this looks somewhat arbitrary, but there is a very structured interpretation of this set of satisfying assignments. So what we have here is we have um, one column in this matrix for every way of picking 0, 1 values such that the top minus this plus this minus that plus that gives you a 1. For each way of picking values that give you a 1, except for the all 1's way of doing it, there is a corresponding column. And this construction is shown to ensure that this relation is not balanced. You cannot apply the polynomial framework. You cannot apply the framework of Victor and Magnus. Um, so the existing positive tools don't give you a linear sparsification for this guy, but also we have no idea how to prove that you cannot get a linear compression. And that's the first obstacle we're looking at. Right, so the open problem is very simple. Does CSP with just applications of this type of constraint admit a linear sparsification, yes or no? Good, uh, then we've made it all the way to the top of our current understanding, uh, which means that at this point we get to hoist the flag and be proud of our achievements. And all that's left for me to do is to briefly conclude. So I showed you the polynomial framework for sparsification. I showed you through a bunch of characterizations that is quite powerful. In some cases, it gives you the provably best results. There's this nice interpretation in terms of embeddings that Victor and Magnus came up with. You can think of what's happening as we have a constraint, um, a CSP, defined over a 0, 1 domain that's hard, and now we can relax this by enlarging the domain. Instead of finding a 0, 1 assignment that satisfies all of our polynomials, say, if we only need to find an integer assignment that satisfies a list of linear equations, then this is polynomial time solvable. So you can think of this relaxation to a larger domain, in the larger domain, figure out which constraints don't cut off any assignments or any solutions to the larger CSP, and these are also redundant constraints for the original. That's a nice way to think about it. So I showed you explicit characterizations of which Boolean CSPs have non-trivial sparsification, which symmetric ones have linear sparsification, and what the optimal sparsification size is, at least if your constraint language only has relations of arity up to three. I gave you a bunch of open problems. The general theme is um, try to fully characterize what the linear sparsifiable cases are of Boolean CSP. After that, characterize everything else. And also, in the non-Boolean case, there's very little we currently know. That's all. Thanks. Algebraic geometry, is there any systematic connection to you know, the classical areas of algebraic geometry over the reals of the complex numbers? So definitely um, there is some 
uh, number theory involved at some point. One of our proofs uses uh, Smith decompositions and Howell normal forms, but I'm not good enough in algebraic geometry uh, to really spot a deep connection if there is one. It might be there. Might be there. I leave it up to uh, larger minds than mine to find it. Robert. Um, so, in your framework of classification, you want to preserve every satisfying assignment, right? So this is great because it allows you to also preserve counting and these kind of things. But is, is anything known if you just want to preserve satisfiability, but you don't care about, satis like about each individual assignment? You just want to make sure that if there was one assignment before, there should be at least one later. This allows you to do some maybe cheat methods. Is anything known for, for this kind of specification? So indeed, it's very natural if you just want to preserve the satisfiability of the instance instead of solution space. Um, all the lower bounds we have work even in the setting. Oh. So we even rule out the fact that you can preserve the satisfiability. So it just happens to be that the positive techniques are powerful enough to preserve the entire solution space. Lower bounds rule out even that. Thank you.